Today we're in the Psalms, and I don't know about you, but I just in the reading of the Psalms, for me it's been a tremendous blessing. And as we arrive here in Psalm 132, we're going to be looking at Psalms 132 through 134. We continue and then conclude the section of the Psalms that are called the Songs of Ascent. So let's begin reading together here in Psalm 132. I'll read uh, the Psalm to you, and then we'll get into our study tonight as we continue our verse-by-verse study through the Psalms. Psalm 132, beginning at verse 1. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty God of Jacob. Surely I will not go into the chamber of my house or go up to the comfort of my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty God of Jacob. Behold, we heard it in Ephrathah. We we found it in the fields of the woods. Let us go into his tabernacle. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness and let your saints shout for joy. For your servant David's sake, do not turn away the face of your anointed. The Lord has sworn in truth to David, he will not turn from it. I will set upon your throne the fruit of your body. If your sons will keep my covenant and my testimony, which I shall teach them, their sons also shall sit upon your throne forevermore. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There I will make the horn of David grow. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame. But upon himself his crown shall flourish. As we go through this particular psalm, it's a psalm that is attributed to King David. We need to remember that David is a man who hungered after the Lord. As a matter of fact, when the Lord was speaking concerning him in in 1 Samuel 13, verse 14, he referred to David as being a man after his own heart. This is an individual that as you study Scripture, you discover that he is in great, he has great love and and a great desire to have fellowship with the Lord. And, And various times as we've gone through his psalms, he has basically written that down for us. And And as we read this particular psalm, once again, it's a psalm of David speaking concerning his desire for the Lord to bless his life and and also referring to the fact that he was a man who had a great desire to see God honored, especially in the building of a temple for him. David is a great example in many ways for us as a believer. He's a person who loved the Lord and sought him. Even though he had sins and those sins that he had were very well known and they're written down in Scripture for all to read, yet he also had a heart for the Lord. And God knew that. David, when he would write, very often would speak concerning that. For example, in Psalm 63, verse 1, he had said, O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So this is an individual who loves the Lord and and greatly hungers after him and thirsts for him. And so he begins here in verse 1 by simply asking for the Lord to remember him. He says, Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty God of Jacob. Surely I will not go into the chamber of my house or go up to the comfort of my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes, slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty God of Jacob. So he's saying, I want, I want you to remember me, Lord, and I want you to remember the various things that I've gone through. I'm asking you, based on your goodness and your righteousness, to bless me. And I'm thanking you because I know that you don't forget me. That's one of the things that I think we as believers today in the 21st century need to really consider, the fact that God has stated to us that he will not forget us, that he does keep us in his consciousness, if you will. He does remember us. And he knows that God is going to remember him, and he knows that God hasn't ignored his afflictions. The Bible tells us in the the New Testament book of Hebrews, in chapter 6, verse 10, that God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. In other words, God is is righteous, and because God is righteous, he remembers. And God remembers his own promises. There's nothing that binds God to man except for his own promises to them. In other words, I can't tell God, you need to do this. God has told me what he will do. 
And that's what binds me to him, and that's what binds him to me, his own word, his own promises. So David is basically saying, Lord, remember your promises. Remember your word that you have given to us. And remember that I've gone through many afflictions, but I've held fast to you. Psalm 34, verse 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. And so he's saying, I'm determined to follow you. Even though I've had troubles and even though I've had affliction or difficulties, even though I have suffered often, my faith has remained strong in you and I rest in you. Now, he says here in verse 2 how he swore to the Lord, vowed to the mighty God of Jacob, surely I will not go into the chamber of my house or go to the comfort of my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes, slumber to my eyelids, until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty God of Jacob. There's two things I want to point out here in these few verses here, verses 3 through 5. One thing that really doesn't relate specifically to the passage, and I say that up front so that you'll note that, and the other thing, obviously, is going to be speaking concerning what he's saying here in the passage. But the one thing I want to point out to you is a very practical thing, and that's why I wanted to do this. I want you to notice something here in verse 2, and it'll also show up in verse 5. I want to show you something very briefly here. In verse 2, notice how he speaks about the mighty God of Jacob. I want you to see that. Notice again in verse 5 when he speaks again in that fashion, the mighty God of Jacob. Now, the mighty God of Jacob is another way of speaking of the God of Israel. He's the God of Israel. Now, why would I want to point out that he's referred to here in this passage here in that fashion? Why is it that he's referred to as the mighty God of Jacob? It's a very basic thing, but some of you may need this in the future if you, if you ever speak to Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, I'm not going to give you a whole lot of information, and this isn't a, a message on how to worship to cults and all of that. But perhaps some of you do not know that Jehovah's Witnesses are a non-Christian cult. Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. I'm supposing every person in this room must know that. If you don't know that, well, Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. They believe that Jesus Christ is Michael the Archangel, the first creation of God. So whenever you speak to a Jehovah's Witness, one of the things that has to be established is your terminology. You have to agree on what words mean because they use the same word that you use, but they, they have a different meaning to that word. So they may say Jesus Christ, and immediately your mind goes to Jesus Christ of the Bible, the New Testament, second person of the Trinity. But when they say Jesus Christ, they're speaking about Michael the archangel, first creation of God. Now, you need to know that. And so when I have spoken to Jehovah's Witnesses, we inevitably will go directly to the deity of Christ, inevitably, because what they are doing is they're actually presenting an ancient heresy that was dealt with by the early church in the fourth century. And they're basically resurrecting that heresy. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that, but this is what I have done. Here in this psalm, we see the term the mighty God of Jacob. When you speak to a Jehovah's Witness, they will say, well, Jesus is mighty God, but he's not the almighty God. You see, in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 9, verse 6, Isaiah was prophesying relating to Messiah, and he said, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And so I've opened up Isaiah 9, verse 6, as I've spoken to Jehovah's Witnesses, and I have pointed them to the fact that Jesus Christ is being referred to here in a prophetic form by Isaiah. And I'll say, I want you to notice how he's referred to as the Mighty God immediately their response will be, well, he is a mighty God because there are gods on the earth and he is a mighty God or a powerful one. But he is not the almighty God. Well, one, here in Psalm 132, he's referred to as God, the Je Je Jehovah God is referred to as the mighty God of Jacob. But Isaiah chapter 10, verse 21, speaking of God Almighty, 
it says the remnant will return the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God. Obviously, he's speaking about God, the God over Israel. And again, in Jeremiah, in chapter 32, verse 18, Jeremiah said, You show loving kindness to thousands and repay the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them, the great, the mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts. And so I wanted to point that out to you because whenever you speak to a Jehovah's Witness, you need to realize that in the back of their mind, the Jesus they're speaking about is different than the one you have grown to worship and love because he's your Savior. He is different. And so as you look at this mighty God, the mighty God of Jacob, it is speaking of the God of Israel, but we also know that this God, the God of Israel, was incarnated, became flesh, and is Jesus Christ. Now, there's something else, though, I wanted to point out here. And as he says here in verses 3 through 5, I will not go into the chamber of my house or go to the comfort of my bed. He's speaking in context of the fact that he didn't feel comfortable resting in a beautiful place that, that he had. He had a palace when the ark of God actually at that time was in a, in a tent. It grieved his heart that God didn't have a temple. Prior to the construction of the temple, God met with people in the tabernacle. David wanted God to have a place because David had a place of his own. Now, in the uh, New Testament, in the book of Acts, in chapter 7, verses 44 through 46, Stephen, the first martyr, was speaking, and he said, Our fathers had a tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. You see, David was a righteous man, loved the Lord, and felt it was not right for him to dwell in a beautiful home while God basically was dwelling in a tent. As a matter of fact, in 2 Samuel, in chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, It came to pass when the king was dwelling in his house, the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, Behold, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. David did not feel comfortable living in a better condition, in his way of thinking, than God Almighty, the God of the universe, lived. And he wanted to build him a house. And that's what he's speaking about here when he says, I won't go into the chamber of my house, go to the comfort of my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes, slumber to my eyelids, until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty God of Jacob. I cannot see myself living a better, if you will, then the God of the universe lives. You know, there's not a lot of people who have a heart like that. That's one of the reasons why the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. There's not a whole lot of people who have that kind of attitude, that kind of heart towards the Lord. And so what, is he, what happens? Well, it says in verse 6, Behold, we heard of it in Ephrathah. We found it in the fields of the woods. Let us go into his tabernacle. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness and your saints shout for joy. And so what happens is he speaks about hearing of it in Ephrata. Ephrata is another name, an ancient name for Bethlehem. It's also in reference to the area surrounding the city of Bethlehem, which is, which is just south of Jerusalem. And what he's speaking about is we heard that the Ark of the Covenant and uh, the, the, um, the presence of the Lord amongst the nation, we heard that it was in a particular location. It was in Ephrata. And so ultimately what happened is, according to 2 Samuel 6, David brought that ark to the, uh, to the city of Jerusalem, and he was weeping as he did so, and then rejoicing in the Lord and dancing before him as they brought the, the ark to him. And that's what he's speaking about. He says, let us go, in verse 7, to his tabernacle, let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, in your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Now, notice verse 9. I want to look at this for just a moment. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness. Let your saints shout for joy. Priests are clothed with righteousness, which speaks about the fact that they are genuinely saved. What he's saying is this. When he says, let your priests be clothed with righteousness, is may those who handle the word, may those who represent you to the people, which were the priests, may they really be saved. There are a lot of people who occupy pulpits week in and week out who preach messages who aren't even saved. 
There are a lot of pastors, unfortunately, not all pastors, but there's more than a few who occupy pulpits who don't even have a relationship with the Lord. You can be a professional minister in, in most countries that allow that to take place. In Germany, you can go to school to become a pastor, a Lutheran pastor, if you will, and you can be um, supported by the government because people are taxed in Germany, and part of their taxes go to support the clergy. And so you don't even have to be saved to be a priest or a pastor in the nation of Germany. In the United States, there are numerous pulpits that are occupied by people who don't have a salvation knowledge of God. There are many people who stand up on a Sunday and give a message and don't even believe the message that they're giving. There are many places, entire denominations right now that are beginning to move in the direction of apostasy. Even as I speak, I could begin to name denominations and all that I won't, but there are numerous uh, people who are occupying pulpits who don't even have a relationship with the Lord. Now, the other day I had an opportunity to be interviewed here at the, at the church. There's a, a fellow, a brother in the Lord, who's um, doing his doctoral dissertation, and uh, he goes to USC. And he uh, asked if he could meet with me. He's meeting with 50 pastors throughout the United States, and he's doing something on leadership. And so he asked if he could meet with me, and I said, sure, that'd be great. So I, I have, I'm a UCLA guy, and I have a Bruin Bear, and I put it on my TV set. I have a TV set inside of the, uh, my office. And he came and sat down, and he began to introduce himself, and nice guy. And I said, I understand you're from SC. And he said, yes, I am. I said, did you notice my TV? And, and, he, and he looks at the TV set, and he sees the little bear just staring at him, you know, and he's just, oh, I don't know if I'm going to enjoy this at all. I said, ah, you will. But we had an interesting time. We had a great time talking. And as we were sharing, and he was interviewing me because he's writing his dissertation and all, we began to speak concerning the things that matter, and especially in leadership, especially leadership of the church. And he asked me a question, and I'm going to use that question right now just as a platform for a moment with you. He asked me a question. He said, let me ask you, what do you consider to be the central element that makes for a biblical leader? What is the number one thing that you think a leader needs to have? Now, I have a list of things that, that I did share with him concerning those things, things like curiosity and, and th things like, uh, like intelligence and, and discipline and, and, and spirit-filled and having faith. I have a list of those things that I was able to give to him that I think are all ingredients or criteria for, for biblical leadership. The number one thing I said to him, and this is what I want to share with you right now, the number one thing that I believe makes her a leader is character. It's got to be character because your character either will prove the words to be true or it'll undermine your whole message. If you preach a message you don't live, it's called hypocrisy. And if a minister stands up there and says, thus saith the Lord, you, we must do these things, and we don't do it ourselves. In reality, what we're doing is undermining the message of God. When you look in 1 Timothy chapter 3, there's something like, um, this may be inaccurate, something like 17 character traits that the Apostle Paul lists there for young Timothy in 1 Timothy 3 when he speaks concerning the qualifications for biblical leadership in the church under the heading of an elder. Something like 16 or 17 character traits. Every one of those are called character traits. When you look at them, when you start to read those traits, there's only one out of that entire list that might be pointed to as a spiritual gift when it says that the bishop must be apt to teach. And when you look at the deacon, he has similar qualifications, but the elder is apt to teach. And there are those who would argue that that doesn't mean that he's simply capable of standing behind a pulpit like I am right now and speaking to groups of people. Apt to teach may also be a character trait because if you live out the message, then you're teaching the strength of the passage. If you're living out the message, your words and your actions unite to form a testimony that declares that God does save sinners and transform lives. And the bottom line is, is God looks for character. When David is praying, may the priests have righteousness, what he is saying in essence is, may they really know God. May they have a relationship with the Lord. Because even as Paul was saying to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3, he said, you're not to place a novice in the position of leadership 
because they may be exalted with self-pride and fall into the condemnation of the devil. And they'll have a terrible testimony to those who are outside of the body of Christ. What are you saying, Paul? I'm saying that a young, puffed-up pastor who falls with pride brings a discredit to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, do not lay your hands on any man suddenly, nor be a partaker of their sins. Because if you see promise in an individual with no tested character, when he stands behind the pulpit and preaches and then falls or fails to live up to the message, it brings discredit to the saving power and keeping power of God and brings God's word into disrepute. When a minister is not walking in the light, when a minister is not living that salvation experience out, the people are going to become like the minister. There's an old saying, like shepherd, like sheep. Ultimately, what happens is out of the abundance of the heart of that minister, the message began to flow, and it creates a dynamic within the confines of the congregation. Those who agree with what he has to say return. Those who don't leave and you end up with a group of people who are pursuing the same things that he pursues. But if he's not pursuing the Lord, they're going to follow him in a path that takes them to destruction, you see. There's an interesting story of shepherds in Israel and all, how the, the sheep will actually follow not only their shepherd, but they also will follow a dominant sheep and they have, some of you have heard this before, they actually have a sheep that they refer to as the Judas sheep. I wonder how many of you have heard that term, Judas sheep. A Judas sheep is the one that they place amongst the sheep that leads them to the slaughter. It leads them to the butcher. They'll follow after this sheep. They refer to him as the Judas sheep. There are ministers, unfortunately, who are like Judas sheep. They don't lead you to the paths of righteousness. And that's why he's saying here very clearly to us that his great desire is that the priests be clothed with righteousness. Now, as a result of that in verse 9, he also prays, let your saints shout for joy. The result will be great joy amongst the people of God when they have ministers who have experienced victory and deliverance and have been blessed by God who bring that to the people. When a shepherd, when a priest is experiencing the righteousness of God and walking in salvation, he can bring that to the congregation and they can be filled with joy as a result of that. That's how it happens. In verse 10, your servant, for your servant David's sake, do not turn away the face of your anointed. The Lord has sworn in truth to David. He will not turn from it. I will set upon your throne the fruit of your body. If your sons will keep my covenant and my testimony, which I shall teach them, their sons also shall sit upon your throne forever. And so basically, God is requested to honor his promise to David and to his descendants. God had made a promise, and you see that promise in 2 Samuel as well as other place, places, even in the, uh, in the, in the Psalms, uh, that he would place David in the throne of authority and that a descendant would actually rule. And so he's saying, I want you to keep your, your promise that you, would, that you would honor David in this fashion. Uh, Jeremiah 33, verse 17 says, Thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. Now that, that promise is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, who is the Messiah, a descendant of David. According to 1 Chronicles 17, 11, and 12, it shall be that it, will, it shall be David, he's speaking to, when your days are fulfilled, when you must go to be with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will be one of your sons. I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. This seed that is raised up was not Solomon, and it was not one of the following kings and descendants of David. What this was is a, a prophecy related to Jesus Christ who is referred to in Matthew 1 as Jesus who is the son of David. And it speaks concerning Messiah, the line of Messiah. So he says, if your sons will keep my covenant and my testimony which I shall teach them, their sons also, also shall sit on your throne forevermore. Now, very few of David's descendants were good kings, let alone good men. As we read our scriptures, only five of them ever saw any kind of spiritual revival come to the nation. And, and ultimately, the nation was taken into uh, captivity to Babylon. 
And so we know that what this is re referring to is Messiah, and we also know that though they sinned, God remembered his promise and brought them back to Israel. Verse 13, for the Lord has chosen Zion. Zion is another name for Jerusalem. The Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. This is the place God has claimed for himself. If you want to keep current with current events, guys, this is one of those scriptures that might help you. All the arguments going on concerning uh, the rights of individuals in Israel to have their own land, etc., the Bible makes it very clear. God has chosen Zion, has desired it for his habitation, and he went on to say, this is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell. I have desired it. So that decision is of the Lord and not of man. Now he says, I'm going to abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will clothe her priests with salvation. Her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There I will make the horn of David grow. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon himself his crown shall flourish. God intends to provide the poor with bread, the priests with salvation, and the saints with joy. All of this ultimately will take place when Jesus Christ rules and reigns. In other words, he's going to honor the prayer as we began in Psalm 132 with verse 1. He's going to honor that where David said, Lord, remember David and all his afflictions. He ultimately will honor that. Jesus Christ will rule and Jesus Christ will reign. Obviously, right now, that's not taking place. But when Jesus does come again, that is going to take place and he will rule and he will reign. Psalm 133. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Now, you have to picture this for a moment. Remember, this is the Song of Degrees or the Psalms of Ascent. The pilgrims are making their way into the city of Jerusalem, and they're now congregating in the city. As they're congregating in the city of Jerusalem, it's very cosmopolitan in appearance. You know, sometimes when we read our Bibles, we fail to understand that, that, that Jerusalem, in the time of pilgrimage, in the three mandatory feast times when people would be coming, very often would have an appearance like any major modern city in our era. You go into uh, Los Angeles today, or you walk into New York, or you walk into Miami, you go to Philadelphia, you go to Chicago, you go to San Francisco, you can go to any major city, and it has a cosmopolitan feel to it. You know, it isn't all just one language there. It's actually changed. I don't know if you know this or not, and this may not appeal to many of you, but uh, I'm going to say it anyway because I feel like it. We were in New York. I've been to New York numerous, numerous times, to the city of New York, New York City. And I've been there a lot of times. I've been going there uh, for more years than I can remember now. And uh, my wife and I went there back in 2001, uh, right around the time when, uh, actually 2002, in February 2002, to minister after 9-1-1. And so we took a team there and members of our church, and perhaps I have some even in this room tonight who went with us then. And we went into New York City, and we stayed in a little place there in the city, a little... Uh, comfort in or something. And uh, in the morning, Marie and I got up and some of the members of our team and we went outside, went down the, the outside and standing there on the sidewalk and right next door attached to this, to this uh, little comfort in was a coffee shop. And so Marie and I went down into the coffee shop and sat down and, and I was sitting with a couple of, the, of our guys in the church and all and, and Marie went to the counter and was ordering some coffee. And so when she did that, she turns to me, and she says, she says, honey, she says, you see these two guys? And she's talking to these guys. I said, yeah, baby. And she, he, she says, do you know where they're from? And, 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 and how would I know? I've never seen them in my life. And I said, um, New York? No, as I'm looking at them, I said, uh, where are they from? She says, they're from Mexico. 
And I'm looking at these guys, and I, I don't know if you've been, how many, how many of you have been into New York City so you, I know who I'm talking to? Okay, and some of you have been there. Listen, when you go into New York before, you know, if you ran across any Hispanics, they were normally Puerto Ricans or Dominicans. I didn't see any Mexicans there. I never did, you know, and, and there are these Mexican guys behind the counter. And so Marie's speaking to them. She says, what are you guys doing here? This is New York. It's cold. What are you doing here? And the guy says, this is funny, he says, we're taking over. And it was funny, we're taking, <laughs> we're taking over. Okay. Do you know we went to Little Italy and there were Mexican cooks in Little Italy? And one of my friends, a Dominican, was telling me, yeah, he says, these Mexican guys are taking over our neighborhoods. Now, why am I telling you that? <laughs> I just feel like it. Because... Because we have to break out of this mentality that, uh, how, how, how can I put this? We have to realize that the world's a lot bigger than we think it is. We have to realize that. Sometimes we don't. If I say Jerusalem to, to you, if you've never been to Jerusalem, you may be thinking of the stereotypical images that you have seen over the years of what a Jewish person looks like. And you have to break that in your mind because Israel was scattered throughout the world. And so you have Ethiopian Jews, you have Japanese Jews, you have South American Jews, you have Jewish people from every area in the world. Now, when this was taking place here in the writing of this psalm, these people would be coming in from every tribe. They would be coming in from different countries. And as they came in, they would be wearing their garb. They would be speaking their languages, maybe, they would be looking different because they've been in other lands. Now they're gathered together. And I want you to see this. And the psalmist says, behold, look at this. Behold how good this is. Be behold how good and how pleasant this is. So what he's watching here, and you have to get this in your mind, eye, because again, this is a song of ascent. They are in the city of Jerusalem. And you see the colorful garb and the languages, but they're all there together in this thing. How good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together. Not just dwell together, crammed into, into houses, you know, next door to each other. No, to dwell together in unity. And what makes that unity is that they've come to Jerusalem to worship God. And that's what gives you unity even in the church in the 21st century is we gather together not because we're around people who speak the same language, though that does help, or not because we're around people who look like I do or dress like I do or are educated like I am. We gather together because we're the body of Christ. We gather together because Jesus has brought us together. That's how it works. And that's what's so good about it. That's why he says, behold, how good and how pleasant it is, how wonderful it is. This is a picture, a beautiful picture of God's desire for his people. His people need community. And their gathering together is a visible emblem of the oneness that occurs when people are united together to worship him. One of the reasons, I hope you don't mind me saying this, and only because it may not make sense to some, but... Again, I was reading recently, as, as I do, and I was reading about part of the reason that communism really doesn't work. And part of the reason is, is because the communistic political system unites people around certain things but never draws them into a sense of community. Communism can draw you towards a philosophic way of thinking, but it does not produce in you a heart of community. And, and, and that's part of the reason why it fails, and I do believe that very strongly. What we have today, and I want to make this as, 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 give it as much application as I can. What we have today is we have a generation of young people who are seeking community even as I speak, who, who, who want to belong to something. And... I really believe it's a, it's a good opportunity for the body of Christ to reach our hands out to young people and to say to them, you know what, we love you and you're welcome here. 
And, and we, want, we want you. We, we embrace you. We want you to be part of the body. You know, and, and again, we have to be very careful that we who are growing older do not start putting them off because we don't understand, you know, anything about them. Because in some ways, some of the things that young people uh, think and, and do are so foreign to those of us who are growing older that it's difficult for us. You see, but the fact is, God wants us to have unity. He wants us to have community, and that community is centered in Him. He doesn't want us to have outward unity. You can have an outward form of unity that's held together by mutual membership or agreeing to abide by certain bylaws. You can have that. There are different things in our society that, that are held together uh, by, by that form of, of glue, if you will. You have labor unions. Uh, you have political parties. You have civic organizations. You have athletic teams. Uh, the interesting thing about all of those things is you don't have to love each other to be part of that organization. I don't have to love the other brother there in, in the Teamsters. I don't have to love him. There's, there's no call for me to do that. I don't have to have a love for the guy I play softball with on, on Monday nights. I'm there to play ball. What has that got to do with anything? I can work in a civic organization as a volunteer, and I don't necessarily have to love the people I'm working with. That is not a requirement. They don't demand that of me. If I want to be in a union, I pay my dues, and that's basically it. I don't have to love the, 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 the president of the union. I don't have to love my brothers or uh, guys who are in the, in the union with me. I, that, it's not required of me. But the one thing that is unique about the church is, is we're not an organization. We are an organism that's organized. And, and what we are is we are a family. We're a family that gathers together, and the earmark of that family, the birthmark of that family, Jesus told us, is love. That's what he said. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Now, he didn't say, by this they shall know that you're teamsters if you have love one for another, or by this they'll know that you're a dodger if you have love one for another. No, he didn't say anything like that at all. What he said was, by this they're going to know you're my disciples. By this the world is going to know that you belong to me. And that's why an African-American, an Asian, a Native American, a Hispanic, an Anglo-American, whatever it is, that's why we can gather together and we don't call ourselves by that name. We call ourselves believers. We're Christians. We love Jesus Christ. That's what matters, you see, and that's how it works in the body of Christ. I, uh, years ago, I had a guy from a, a major Christian uh, magazine interview me, and he was talking to me, asking me some questions, and, and he, he asked me a question. He said, um, may I ask you what your demographic, that's a nice word. In other words, what's your racial profile in your church? What is your demographic? And I said, are you asking me about the percentage of breakdowns? He said, yeah. And I began to share with him. And I said, well, you know, we have a, and I, I shared some things with him and, and all. And I said, we have a large Hispanic population. You know what he asked me after that? He says, do you play uh, Hispanic music for worship? Is that what draws them? I said, oh, yeah, we put a hat on the, on the platform and... and <laughs> I put my boots and my hat on, and man, we go. Yeah, we hand spray cans and spray paint for the people so they can ride on the walls. I said, no, of course not. Well, what do you attribute to the large Hispanic population? And I said, Jesus. Jesus, no, Jesus, you know. <laughs> it's Jesus. I'm telling you something, guys. That still is not getting through right now. It is still not getting through. It's all about Him. It's all about Him. And if we could grab that in our hearts, if we really understood that, then it, it doesn't matter to you what color that person is next to you right now. That is the first, furthest thing from your mind. That is the furthest thing from your mind. You know, you're not walking in saying, let's see, there's one, two, three, four, I'll go sit over there, you know. <laughs> I hope you're not. <laughs> it's love, guys. It, 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 that's what it is. It's, it's, it's the love of the Lord, and, and it's something that is wonderful. You know, in the Bible, the church is referred to in various ways. The, the church is referred to as the bride of Christ. It's referred to as being the family of God. Uh, we're called believers, we're referred to as disciples, and we're referred to as, as Christians. Uh, but the thing that we are is we are the body of Christ. We are the body. And in, in 1 Corinthians in chapter 12, uh, verses 20 and 21, 
Uh, Paul said this. He said, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. In other words, the body is a unit, and it all works together, and, and, and every part is necessary. And God didn't redeem man so that man could become uh, an isolated believer just living on their own. Uh, when I grew up, we used to have a, a, a program on TV called The Lone Ranger. I don't even know if anybody here even heard of that before. I thought about that as I was writing up my message. I bet these people don't even know who The Lone Ranger was. Anybody know who The Lone Ranger? Who am I speaking? You are old. You are old. You are older than dirt, and you know it. For you younger people, The Lone Ranger was a Texas Ranger, and he ended up fighting crime and all, and they had silver bullet, and it was all kinds of things. And we grew up watching... Uh, this kind of thing. But he was known as the Lone Ranger because he was on his own. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. You weren't saved to be isolated, in other words. You were brought into the body of Christ, and you have a part that's important within the body of Christ. Every portion within the body is important, even if you think it's not. If you don't think that every member of the body is important, then just liken it to your own body. And let me ask you a question. If you don't think every portion is important, what portion of your body would you donate tonight? What would you like to lose besides your weight? <laughs> well, I'll give you 50 pounds of fat. No, I'm not talking about that. You want to give a hand? You want to give an eye? You want to give an ear? You want to give a foot? What do you want to give away today? And I think what you're going to say is, I don't want to give anything away today. I would like to come out with the same number of fingers I came in with. You don't want to even give the little pinky? How about your big toe? You want to give that away? No? How come? Because every part's important to you? Yes? Is that why? Of course. Because my body is important to me, and I'm going to keep as much of it as I can. You are a member of the body of Christ. You are significant within the church. You have gifts. You have calling. You have abilities. Not one of you is a second-ranked citizen. So God wants us to have relationship. And as we experience the unity of the Spirit, it's a tremendous testimony to those who aren't saved. As a matter of fact, Jesus actually prayed that we would exhibit unity so that when the world, which is always pecking at itself and hurting itself and warring against itself, when the world, world saw the church's love, it would be a testimony of God to this angry world. In John 17, 20 and 21, Jesus prays, and he said, I don't pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, and that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. May the unity of the body of Christ be so spectacular and obvious that the world will know that something has happened to draw these strangers together and actually make them love one another. I know those of you who are with us on Sunday uh, probably greatly appreciated Dr. Heinsohn. I certainly did. His messages, I thought, were, 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 were wonderful. Very, very good messages and all. But I was, I was touched uh, afterwards on Sunday night. I was speaking to, uh, to Dr. Heinsohn, and, and he said, you know, I'd like to come back and speak here again. And I said, you know, we'd love to have you again uh, for sure. And he said to me, you know what? He said, I really enjoyed the church, your fellowship that you have here. He says... They love the Word. He says, it gives me a pleasure to speak to people who actually love the Bible. And he said, you know, you've got a lot of good people here. And I said, absolutely. They're good people. They're great people because they love the Lord Jesus Christ. That makes it a wonderful place to be, of course. Well, that's what Jesus prayed for, guys, that we might be one. So that's a testimony that God is in your midst. And that's exactly what the body of Christ is to be. And, and so behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Absolutely. There's nothing like a house in unity, but man, when it's in disunity, oh boy, that can be such a pain. When you've got a kid who's a brat, oh, anyway, I'll move into verse 2. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. So he rejoices as he sees the multitudes visiting and, 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 and probably laughing and just worshiping God 
together. And, and as he sees this, he recognizes it as spiritual fellowship, and he anoints that spiritual fellowship with the anointing oil of the high priest. You see, in the Old Testament, anointing oil, it's called anointing oil, uh, was actually used that, uh, in, in a consecration or a setting apart uh, process for, for, for the priests of, of Israel. You, you see, the, you see the various things consecrated. Exodus, if you're taking notes, in Exodus chapter 30, verses 25 through 30, uh, speaks of the anointing oil that was used on the tabernacle, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the table, its utensils, the lampstand, its utensils, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering, and its utensils, the laver and the base. They were all anointed with anointing oil, but also, according to Exodus 30, verse 30, God said, you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister to me as priests. And so the oil represents the anointing of the Spirit of God on the priest. And so when they would pour oil, you get this in your head for just a moment because uh, here in, in our church, there are times when I have people who approach me after a service and they say, I'm, I'm not feeling well. Can you pray for me and anoint me? I have a, a little um, vase here that has oil in it and I'll just open it up, and I just take a small amount, and I'll put it on the forehead, and, and then we pray just a small amount. Uh, that isn't true with, with the, the anointing of the high priest or the priest. What they would do is they would just pour oil all over them. Imagine that for a minute. Now, I don't have time to go into this and probably should have, but when you read the description of the high priestly garb, he was dressed impeccably and beautifully. He had his hat, gold, he had linen, he had a breastplate with 12 precious stones, each stone representing one of the tribes of Israel. And when he was bathed, because he had to bathe and, and, and set apart, and he would put on these beautiful robes and he would step out, the man, you know, in this absolutely beautiful garb, would be standing there, and you would be looking at the beauty and the perfection of the priestly garb. And as he's standing there, they would take bucket, a bucket of oil and then slop it all over him. Now, picture that for a minute. He's standing there all nice, and pfft, there goes all this oil. And it would come from the top of his head, down his beard, drip down to the hem of his garment. God was saying the outward beauty needs to be drenched with my spirit or it's just flesh. If you don't have this drenched with my spirit, you cannot serve me. And so you need to be drenched in the spirit. That's the picture. And as the oil would pour from his beard, it would land on the 12 stones, which represented the 12 tribes. And it's speaking of a picture of God's anointing on the nation. And God wants to, even to this day, anoint with his Holy Spirit our lives so that we have his presence in us so that the beauty of our outward appearance is sanctified by the power of his holy spirit that is a major major key to your walk with god you may have it all great on the outside but until it's drenched with the spirit it's of no value to god so he says when i see this it's like it's like when aaron receives the anointing, he says, is spiritual. It's like the dew on the Mount of Hermon. Mount Hermon is to the north. It's about 10,000 feet in its highest elevation, and, it, and, it, and it's so cool that the precipitation, the dew, is settling on it on a daily basis. But during the time of the, the uh, pilgrimages, sometimes they would go in the season when it was very hot in Jerusalem, and there would be no dew whatsoever. And so he's saying that even in the dryness of Jerusalem, when you come, you're refreshed with the presence of water from heaven. And water, once again, is a picture in Scripture. It can be used as a picture in Scripture of the, uh, of the, uh, the Spirit of the Lord, who, who, who Jesus pictured as being a well that springs up within you. And, and, and the picture that he's given to us is spiritual worship. And it all occurs when you're walking in the Spirit. And that's how you can have unity in the Lord, walk in the Spirit. And then finally, Psalm 134, Behold, bless the Lord. All you servants of the Lord who by night stand in the house of the Lord, lift up your hands in the sanctuary, bless the Lord. The Lord who made heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. And so it concludes here with Psalm 134, the song of ascent, Psalms of ascent. 
And this final psalm places the pilgrim in the house of the Lord as he's worshiping God. And, and I want you to see he's lifting up his hand and he's blessing the Lord. He's blessing the Lord of all the earth. Now notice the call here. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Now when he's speaking concerning the fact that they are standing in the house of the Lord, that word stand is a connotation that they're not standing, they're just standing, but they're actually serving. It's a picture of service in the house of the Lord. So it's a picture of sincere worship to God that results from serving Him. I wonder how many of you guys remember an old preacher by the name of J. Vernon McGee. J. Vernon. Man's on every, every radio station in the world, I think, preaching the gospel. When I first got saved, I heard J. Vernon on a Christian station, and I must confess, the first time I heard him, it drove me nuts. You know, because you know, he had that slow southern drawl, and, and I was just kind of, hurry up, man, get to the point. You know, what is it you're trying to say? Uh, I grew to love him tremendously over time, though. I grew up and grew to love him. And I realized what a tremendous treasure he was to the body of Christ and remains to this day. Though he's dead, he still speaks. And you still hear his messages as, as they're uh, broadcast uh, throughout the world. But anyway, J. Vernon McGee was a very strongly conservative man. I can share a, a lot about him with you, but I won't. But I will say this. He was very strongly conservative. And J. Vernon said, you know, when he says, I, I have been young and now I am old. And he said this, and I'm paraphrasing. He said, i got to tell you, he says, I think it was a poor thing that occurred to the church when formality of worship began to stifle the worshiper. He said, you need to have a heart of worship. Now, to me, this is a radical statement from J. Vernon McGee, who is extremely conservative in that way. And he's, he's, what he's saying is this. He's saying, you know, you ought to raise your hands to the Lord. You know, I've encouraged this church before. Allow me to do it again. When you worship the Lord, worship Him. Don't draw attention to yourself. But if the song says that we'll lift up our hands unto the Lord, it's okay to do that. And, and, and don't feel like, oh, no, I'm in some kind of radical place that they're going to start barking, running around, and, and swinging tambourines at me and s sliding down from the ceiling. You know, that's not what we're going to do, at least not this week. I, I really think, maybe next week, I, I really think that you need to just allow yourself, you know, in, in, in the confines of what is proper, uh, allow yourself to worship God. And, and I, have, I have no reservation, I should say this openly, I, I have no reservation raising my hands before the Lord because the Bible says to do that. That's what we just read. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless His name. And it's okay. Now, I'm not going to say, okay, let's practice everybody. One, two, three, up. I'm not going to say that, you know. Christian aerobics, you know. Up, down, up, down, you know. I'm, yeah, I've seen some people struggling at that. They, they want to raise their hands, and you see them going. <laughs> no, you know what? Raising your hands to the Lord, it's a command here. He says, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Now, as you're blessing the Lord, I want you to see verse 3, the Lord who made heaven and earth bless you. As you're blessing the Lord, he's blessing you in response. Listen, when you open up your heart to the Lord and say, you know what, Lord, I've jumped up and acted crazy at basketball games. I've acted like a fool at a baseball game when somebody hit a home run. And I'm up there going, yeah. I come to church. These guys are fanatics, you know. I've seen people driving in their cars, their music's playing, and the veins are coming out of their neck. As they, <laughs> and the ears are bleeding, you know. And they're always mad for some reason while they're singing, too. Then you come to church, and, and you can see sometimes people really get, yeah, I, I, sometimes you'll see, you'll see them, their foot. <laughs> What's that all about? Oh, you see the hands. <laughs> the Bible tells us in Lamentations 341, let us lift our hearts and hands to God in heaven. Let us do that. Let us worship the Lord. It's a good thing to do. You say, well, that's Old Testament. Well, in 1 Timothy 2, verse 8, Paul said, I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And as you worship the Lord and bless Him, He blesses you. And that's basically, I think, what we want, isn't it? To bless Him and to receive blessings from Him.